share with you first and foremost, you're welcome. You are always welcome in this church that seeks to be a place for everyone. A few announcements to share with you. Our senior high youth just got back a while back from Montreat uh, in North Carolina, had a wonderful time, and we get to hear about it in a couple weeks on July 11th. They're going to tell us about their trip and the Montreat Youth Conference. And then the very next day, our middle schoolers will take off to Wisconsin for their summer youth experience. And so I ask that you keep our youth ministry in your prayers over the course of this summer. Also speaking of uh, music, as I shift gears now, it is so nice to hear people singing in worship. For a while now, we're going to let soloists sing on our behalf. And we're thankful to have Kelly here to do that for us. Oh, it feels so good to hear somebody singing in the sanctuary again. We'll get a chance to sing ourselves later on this summer. So, you know, go home and warm up your vocal cords to get ready for a congregational singing a little bit later. Also, speaking of music, you'll note a special music note from Sue there. Uh, the special music uh, is a collection of women that Sue has known over the course of her ministry. Uh, people from Minnesota to Fort Dodge to here and a variety of places and you'll see all of those faces and hear those voices in our special music that it will be a real treat. So let us then now prepare our hearts and minds to worship the living God. Hear now these words as a call to worship. I use uh, the first verse of the hymn, To God Be the Glory, hymn number 634. Hear these verses as a call to worship. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world, he gave us his son, who yielded his life in atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Let us worship the living God with our opening hymn, hymn number 
268, the first and fourth verses you'll see there. You're welcome to hum or sing quietly to yourself as we hear Kelly sing our opening hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Every time we gather together and worship, we come in the presence of the living God and we realize that we fall short of what God expects of us, what God requires of us. So each week, Johnny or I try to give you a prompt to think about as we confess our sin against God and neighbor. So this week you get another lesson learned while learning to walk with a cane. Uh, Beth and I love the Sturgis Falls weekend and love to go to the festivals and hear the music. Uh, our favorite is the Cedar Basin Festival at Sturgis Park there, the band shell and the grass. And the lesson I learned walking with a cane is, you know, the grass is uneven in spots and the ground goes up and down just a little bit. And in some places the gravel is a little bit loose. So when you're walking with a cane, you really gotta look down and see where you're going one step at a time. But if that's all you do, you end up walking into the back of a food truck. Okay, so you have to look up some to see where you're going, to see what's around you. And so here's the prompt. How much of your life have you spent looking down and haven't been able to see what's ahead? Haven't been able to see the good that God has prepared for you? The victory that has won on your been one on your behalf because you're too busy looking straight down and then when you do that you end up walking into the back of a food truck so let us keep silence before God and figure out how we might correct our perspective let us pray In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Wherever we may have wandered, wherever we may be stuck, God's love finds us. God's love claims us. God's love keeps us. God's love cleanses us of all of our guilt and all the pain that goes with it. So believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us respond to that now. As we join in the response, we are forgiven hymn number 447. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now grounded in grace, let us celebrate the peace we have received in Jesus Christ by sharing it with one another and with the whole world. The peace of Christ be with you. I encourage you to share the peace with one another. Before we turn to God's holy word in scripture, let us first turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we pray in these moments that you would send your Holy Spirit into this place and wherever we may be listening, that you might break apart our hearts of stone so that we might hear what you have to say and to hear it clearly. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It is good to be back with you all, siblings in Christ, after being away at camp. Thank you for keeping all of us in your prayers while we were away. We're continuing our sermon series this day of preaching your favorite scripture passages. Those of our current elders and deacons, our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from a multiple of sources. The primary one, of course, being the Holy Spirit, but also from Art Cox. (laughs) Actually, you're going to be getting a double dose of Art because you'll hear another one of his passages next week. And our New Testament lesson, of course, again, comes from the Holy Spirit, but also from Clois Engelkus this morning. You'll be hearing uh, both of their favorite scriptural texts, so... Our first reading comes from the Old Testament this morning, comes from the book of Psalms, the 22nd Psalm to be precise. I'll be, uh, I've selected a few verses from that Psalm, not reading it in its entirety. You can see it up there on the screen, verses 1 through 5, followed by verses 23 through 31. Hear God's word to you now from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For God did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that God has done it. It's a great favorite passage there, Art. Thank you. (laughs) Our New Testament lesson this morning comes from Paul's first letter to the church, church in Corinth, chapter 15, verses 54 through 58. Listen to God's word to you from 1 Corinthians. When this perishable body puts on imperishability and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. 
death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And at this time, I'd like to invite the children forward if they wish. If they're physically present here, they can come down to the steps, and, or you can stay in the pews if you like. Those who are watching online, please come to the, uh, to the screen, the tablet, or the computer. Okay. Well, my friends, I hope you're all doing well this week. And again, it is good uh, to be back with you back from North Carolina. We had such a great time. This morning, I want to talk to you about winning. Winning. Uh, back when I was, I don't know, somewhere between 8 and 10 years old, I used to love playing soccer. And... One year, our team did really well, and I mean really well. We went undefeated. We won every game. We won the state championship in South Carolina. I remember our teams getting this, these sets of gold medals, and it just felt so good, and we celebrated, and it was amazing. One of the happiest memories I have. Felt good to win. I was young, and I know that I didn't pay a lick of attention to the team who lost, who worked so hard to get to that championship game just like we did. I know that there were a lot of tears there. They weren't feeling good. They were sad. And I and the rest of my team just went right on reveling and celebrating. <laughs> we did it! And I'm sure even some of us probably pointed at the other team and said, tough luck, too bad. I hope I didn't do that. But I can't say for certain if I did or didn't. I can tell you what God would have wanted me and the rest of my team to do. Of course, when we work hard and we do well, we should celebrate. That's great. But we certainly should never point and laugh and make fun of the team who lost. God would have wanted us, after our celebration, to go over to them, maybe put our arms around the people we knew and said, that was great. Great game. You guys played so well, and I bet you'll get back to this game next year, maybe even win. You see, my friends, God doesn't, isn't really interested in us standing with those who are victorious those who are doing well, those who are mighty and feeling good about themselves. I think what God is really interested in and what God wants us to do is stand with those who are feeling bad, those who aren't doing so well, those who have lost, those who have maybe even lost everything. So I would encourage you, my friends, to do that. When you win, that's great. But also go over to those people who lost, who are sad, and say, you did well, and I'm proud of you. Let us go to God in prayer. Our Lord and our God, we thank you so much for loving us. Help us to love others just as much as you do and just as powerfully. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, my friends. Amen. 
I'll give that uh, not only an amen, but a holy moly. <laughs> Woo. Tough act to follow. I'll do my best. Thank you, Sue. Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight. Oh, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Just do it. Just do it. Do you recall that famous trademarked slogan? Do you remember where it comes from? To whom it belongs? Just do it is, of course, the longtime slogan of Nike, the worldwide giant in athletic shoes and clothing and equipment. The company's been around since the mid-1960s, I believe, growing into one of the largest and most recognizable multinational corporations on the planet. A true success story. But have you ever wondered to what exactly Just Do It is referring? Just do what? Just do what? <laughs> I think perhaps the answer to that question can be found in the history of Nike. And I'm talking long before the mid-1960s. You see, in Greek mythology, Nike is the goddess of victory. The goddess of victory. Images of her can often be seen accompanying legendary athletes and ancient scenes of sport. 
the Olympics, of course. Given the corporation's mythological origins, then, it stands to reason that the blank we're trying to fill, just do what, might be rooted in the idea of victory. Just be victorious. Just succeed. Just win. Just do it. Win. Our modern day society, particularly in these United States, tends to elevate and exalt success and winning to the point where they've become idols. Winning and being right seem to blend together these days. Both opportunities to lord our supposed superiority over others. We crave those moments when we can revel in our opponent or our rival's misfortune and defeat. And once we've beaten them, we immediately, immediately steer our energies and efforts toward keeping them down, below us, beneath us, in their place. We quickly turn our attention to next season's championship, to overturning that coming legal appeal, to strategizing our re-election campaign. Nike is also the Greek word for victory, found three times in our New Testament lesson this morning from 1 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, sounds exceedingly confident in Christ's victory over sin and death. In fact, Paul sounds more than confident. He sounds downright cocky, filled to the brim with bluster even. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? It's almost like Paul is taunting death itself. This is Paul talking trash. What you got, death, huh? Not too scary now, are you? Let's go. Give me your best shot. Oh, looks like somebody lost their sting. Oh, that's too bad. Did somebody misplace their sickle? Oh, how embarrassing. U-G-L-Y, you ain't got no alibi, you ugly. Yeah, yeah, you ugly. You see, Paul makes frequent use of sports imagery and athletic metaphors throughout his letters. Surely then, he's, he's witnessed the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat along with a competitor's arrogance or dangerous overconfidence. But he is most certainly all in when it comes to Christ the victor. Christ the conqueror of sin and death and hopelessness. Indeed, there is no such thing as being too confident or too zealous in Jesus' resurrection from the dead and what it means for those who believe and yet, and yet it's important to point out that Paul is writing with the advantage and the clarity of hindsight. He is several decades removed from Jesus' death and resurrection. Those like Paul, with time on their side looking back, can see the victory this has become for Christ and, in turn, those who believe in him. But remember, Paul was a persecutor of the church when Jesus was crucified. And for at least three days after that fateful Friday, Jesus' death felt like the opposite of victory for those who loved him. For the disciples, knowing Jesus had breathed his last was a gut-wrenching, tragic defeat a disappointing letdown, solidifying Rome's oppressive stranglehold on the Jewish people. This was 
clearly not the Messiah they expected. The one who would come to restore the kingdom of David and overthrow their Roman overlords. This was not the new Moses come to free God's people from Caesar, the new Pharaoh. If Jesus were that person, his life wouldn't have ended in such pathetic misery. Gone the way of a common criminal. One among three, in fact. Yes, in a previous life of Paul's before his conversion, that cross was his and Rome's victory over that blasphemer from Nazareth. Undeniable evidence that the God of Israel was never on that troublemaker preacher's side. Proof that Paul's campaign of terror against Christians was justified. Indeed, that cross standing between two others seemed to suggest that the religious movement launched by the man hanging lifeless upon it was a failed movement, an unsuccessful revolution, a lost cause. I mean, don't conquerors conquer? Aren't victors supposed to be victorious? Winners win, right? They aren't mocked, laughed at, and hung up to dry between two nameless thieves. Yes, even by today's standards, certain individuals might argue Jesus was a loser. One might say he was weak, he's a disgrace not fit to rule, not strong enough. For crying out loud, what kind of Messiah dies before their first battle's even begun? And even Jesus' own words from the cross perhaps can prop up such a viewpoint. Echoing the psalmist's lament, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We see Jesus' full humanity clear as day. A dying man who's frightened and in pain, abandoned by his friends and by the God he serves. Seriously, this guy's the Messiah? He's the one we've been waiting for? This is your conquering hero? (laughs) Give me a break. Riddle me this. Why on earth would the God of Israel forsake the supposed Messiah of Israel during his greatest time of need? It makes no sense. At least, it wouldn't make sense if that's where our story ended. We know the story does not end there. We know Jesus rises from the grave. We with the benefit of two millennia's hindsight, know the resurrection became the greatest success story ever told, the biggest comeback in history, a rallying cry for the church then and now. And Paul, with the benefit of decades of hindsight, knew the victory of Christ's resurrection, that all is in vain if Christ has not been raised but knew also that that message took time to proliferate the world, took time to get out. It took a lot of hard work, preaching and persuasion and mission to open the ears of so many. It took, according to Paul at least, the risen Christ appearing to more than 500 people before the best news ever given began to take root and spread. Yes, my friends, our Lord's public disgrace of a death wouldn't make sense if the psalmist stopped at, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We, with the breadth of Scripture at our disposal, know the psalm goes on. Jesus knew the psalm went on too. 
Jesus knew the psalm ended with the confidence that God hears our cries. Jesus knew the psalm ended with an abiding hope in God's grace extending to countless future generations, those already passed on and those yet to come, joining hands to worship the Lord. Jesus knew the psalm gave voice to the hopeless and restless while also holding on to the belief that God will overcome our hopelessness and restlessness, that God is our champion, that God is victorious over suffering and death. Giving a nod, even, to eternal life. May your hearts live forever. And I shall live for him, says the psalmist. Christ utters those famous last words from the cross, those we know so well because he knew the psalm so well. Words that express the authentic dread and despair of a flesh and blood human being, yes, but words that also express Christ's fundamental hope in God's promise to redeem him from the pit of despair and fulfill his most glorious purpose. Yes, perhaps our Savior's ignominious death wouldn't make much sense if he had went about his earthly life preaching about the importance of winning and being right and lording one's status and wealth and fame and achievements and conquests over one's enemies. Sure, might make sense then. Yes, then perhaps I might understand why many at the time and some long after the fact view Jesus' death by crucifixion as shameful and disqualifying for any would-be Messiah. But Jesus didn't value those things, did he? Jesus didn't speak like a wannabe famous person seeking glory. Jesus never preached any of that stuff. Instead, Jesus preached about the importance of losing. Jesus spoke about the honor of coming in last place. He preached about losing one's life in order to save it, including laying down his own life willingly. Jesus taught that the first about loving and praying for one's enemies, not even stopping short of welcoming them at your dinner table. Siblings in Christ, there's no question about whether Jesus will just do it. He's done it. It's done. It is finished. Sin and death have been swallowed up in victory. And through our faith in Christ, we too can lay claim to that victory. Now, it's true. It's true, we still feel the sting of death on this side of glory. As long as we see in a mirror dimly, grief isn't going away. But that sting isn't meant to last, not forever. It too shall pass, along with the tears our God will surely wipe away. Tears our Lord has promised to wipe away with God's gentle yet victorious right hand. In his letter to Rome, Paul again uses the Greek word Nike, that word for victory, a passage we'll explore later on in this sermon series. Predictably, Paul uses it during another moment of great confidence in God's boundless love. After offering a a list of things that may make us feel separated from God, Paul asks whether those things ultimately separate us from God's love. 
And Paul's response is swift. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. More than conquerors through Christ who loved us. But that word rendered as conquerors comes from Nike. Nike. Which is why I'd like to offer an alternative translation, if you will. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. My God, my God, isn't that the greatest news? To the victor goes the spoils. And my friends, our unearned and undeserved spoils are an ocean of grace and the steadfast love and mercy of the living God whose Son died for us. Thanks be to God who will never leave us nor forsake us, who is closer than the air we breathe, especially during our most fearful and painful moments, who gives us the victory, the overwhelming victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Receiving of God's word proclaimed, please receive our affirm affirmation of faith. It is an affirmation of faith that is going to be sung for us by Kelly. Goodness is stronger than evil. Hymn number 750. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Love is stronger than death. Victory is ours. Victory is ours. Through God who loves us. Victory is ours. Victory is ours. Through God who loves us. Come before our God in prayer on this particular Sunday, continuing our pattern, of course, of praying for the world one nation at a time. We return to Europe uh, this Sunday, praying for the Southern European uh, enclave of San Marino. We'll be praying for them and their people this day, as well as a number of concerns around the world and a number of concerns closer to home. Let us go to God in prayer. O oh God of grace and God of glory, we we'll give you thanks for always being nearer to us than the air we breathe. We we'll give thanks for the victory that is ours through Christ who loved us and loves us. Lord, we pray for the European enclave of San Marino this day. Lord, we give thanks that your gospel is so prevalent there. Give thanks for the beauty of that particular area of Italy. Give thanks for wonderful social programs that proliferate that small nation, for the wonderful uh, systems of medical care that they have in that area. We give thanks for their bolstering tourism industry, O oh God, and we pray that that industry might continue to expand. And finally, O oh God, we pray for a number of concerns in that particular area of the world. Pray for their battle with air pollution, water shortages, and a decreasing amount of rural farmlands due to increasing urbanization. Lord, you know their problems better than any of us, and we pray that your will 
might be done in and through the people of San Marino. Looking elsewhere around the world, O oh God, we pray for the continuing political unrest in the northern African nation of Libya. We pray that your spirit might be present within Libya and those and their people during these days, that you might protect the vulnerable there. Of course, God, we continue to lift up your hurting world as it continues to battle the COVID pandemic, particularly in light of the Delta variant that seems to be spreading around the world, including in our own country. Pray for all of those grieving as a result of this pandemic. Pray that you might be with them, that your spirit might be palpably present with them and alongside them, especially with those who are grieving, O Lord. God of mercy, we pray that your spirit might also be present with those in the community of Surfside, Florida, after that collapsed condo building. God, we pray for all of those families who know that their loved one has passed away and also those of those who are so, of so many missing people. God, so many missing families in that community, oh God, and we pray that you would be present with all of them. We are bold to pray for hope. In addition, O oh Lord, we pray for our nation and others as a result of increasingly high temperatures just seem to, to get higher and higher. Pray for the threat of drought. And like communities across the millennia, we are bold to pray for rain, O oh Lord. We pray for rain. We pray for the rebuilding efforts and all those whose lives were taken after a tropical storm Claudette wreaked havoc last week. And Lord, a number of concerns closer to home, we lift up the Frost family, particularly, particularly Cassie Frost's grandmother, Elaine, who is currently undergoing treatment for a GI bleed. Lord, also we lift up to you Wendy Henderson's sister, Deb, experiencing a number of health complications. Pray also for Josh Beal's cousin, Ryan, who was hit by a car and is currently in the ICU, suffering multiple injuries and undergoing multiple surgeries. We pray for all those, O oh Lord, undergoing or anticipating surgery, recovering from it. Pray for all those who have been diagnosed with cancer and are undergoing various treatments, chemo, immunotherapy, radiation. Pray that you would be with all of them, O oh Lord, and their care teams, their doctors, their nurses, their surgeons, everyone involved. Lord, we also lift up Tin Glatt's sister, Terry, who is hospitalized with multiple issues and then plans to go to rehab for several weeks. We pray for her rehabilitation. Finally, O oh God, we pray for our own Pastor Dave as he continues to battle nerve pain and back issues. Pray for his upcoming appointment with a neurosurgeon. Finally, O Lord, we lift up to you all the cares of our hearts that are too painful to articulate, articulate during this time. Give thanks for your Holy Spirit that brings those particular concerns to your throne, regardless of our ability to speak them out loud. We pray this in the name of our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples then and his disciples now to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, siblings in Christ, in response to everything that God has given us, let us worship God with our living and our giving, giving cheerfully and generously of our time, talents, and treasures. And finally, please join us for our closing hymn. It is hymn 
number 233, the day of resurrection. for all those who have had the courage to step up for the rights of everyone created in God's image. Pray that you might receive this benediction in the spirit of Pride Month. Go. Go from this place where we declare all are loved. All are made in the image of God into a world that does not agree. Go. Go to be Christ's body, which means... Go to be safety. Go to be affirmation. Go to embody the welcome that Christ has extended to you your whole life long. Gird yourself with the truth of your belovedness. Armor yourself with the knowledge of a God whose love is beyond all of our imaginings. Walk surrounded by the peace that can match hatred and death. Go. Go to be ambassadors of the God who is love. Amen. Oh, oh, oh. 